You are listening to The Call-In, a series of conversations recorded by Array with filmmakers of color and women of all kinds to discuss feature, narrative, and documentary work. This conversation with Array releasing filmmakers, Agam Darshi, the director of Donkey Head, and Tyrone Tommy, the director of Learn and Swim, was recorded on August 17th, 2022. Both films are now streaming on Netflix. Hey everybody, my name is Agam Darshi and I'm the writer and director of Donkey Head. And I'm super honored and excited to be here today with Tyrone Tommy, who is the writer and director of Learn to Swim, a beautiful film that I got to watch last night. And I'm so happy that I did. So welcome. I'm so excited to be able to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, uh, thank you for jumping on and having this conversation with me, uh, passing right. on the torch of the <laughs> Ray Filmmakers. We're part of the Familia now. Yeah, so your film was picked up, well, let's like reverse, it, it uh, premiered at TIFF last year, mm. um, and then did the whole festival circuit. It is a Canadian film, so it had his, its Canadian release uh, in March, you said? Yeah, in March of, of this year, 2021. And then Array picked it up, and now it's on Netflix all over the world. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <on> Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Which is wild to think about. Um, it's one of those things you you know all, you know all of us dream about having our film just be out in the world like that, you know, watchable by everybody, and you know, surreal to have it be happening now. Absolutely, but you had success with your short film Mariner, right? That came out like a 2016 while. Two thousand sixteen was Mariner. Two thousand sixteen, and that went to TIFF. So you've mm. you've kind of like you're used to sort of getting a lot of. Um, accolades and acclaim with the work that you do so this is just sort of like next level right oh it's 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 very next level I mean <laughs> um, working with the team here has been has been wonderful I mean the thing with shorts is like you're, you're by yourself for a lot of for all of it right um, even after you finish it you know I guess I think now there might be some more distribution channels for films like short films but you know at the time it was very much you know, we we did get to do a Vimeo staff pick, which I'm very, very, which I was very proud of. But um, yeah, you're sort of like by yourself for that whole thing of trying to like promote your film and taking yeah, it out of you were. Team, hey. Yeah, so it's nice to have a, a team that yeah loves a film and wants to support you and is sort of making some of those connections as well. So. So, are you surprised that people that this film resonated the way it did? In some ways, yeah, and in, in other ways, I mean, I always make films from a very personal, intimate space. So I'm never quite thinking about where it's going to go afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. I try to create an experience with the film, and ideally when someone watches it, they go along with that experience, all the choices we've made take them into that world and all that journey. And so as far as, as thinking about like where it would go or how it would connect. It was something I wasn't necessarily thinking about at the time, but as we made the film, everyone brings in their own energy and perceptions of what's happening and you start making those connections. And so now what's really, really humbling is when we present it to an audience and people come up and they're like, I've gone through that experience or I, I feel what that person was going through. and, and you know that other people go through these things, but it always feels so, you know, inside of yourself when you're doing it. Like you're the only person who's ever had this happen. Absolutely, yeah. I, I'm always. I was always amazed um, to hear other people's ideas of what the film was about. Like when when I when my film was out there, I was always amazed that some people felt it was a father daughter film. Some people felt like it was a family film. Some people felt like it was about Mona. Do you find that as well? Do you find that people are coming up to you with their own sort of interpretation about what it is that you you were going for, what what it is that your what your message was, or do you feel like across the board it's fairly pe people get it? They they're all on the same page. No, there's a lot of people. I mean, there's people that don't like it at all, which is always which is always fun as well. Um, most people don't tell you yeah, when they don't like it. But every so often, every so often you get someone who comes up and they're like, I did not like that. Like, <laughs> Tell me more. Um, but uh, the, it, it's interesting because, you know, there are some things in the film that aren't 
necessarily spelt out or things that we say specifically. Mm -hmm. So it does leave some room for people to sort of impart their own idea of where Selma went or what happened to her um, or who Desi is. And, and, you know, he's a very unreliable narrator in the film. Which is yeah. Um, yeah. So that naturally just leads people to different sort of conclusions about how the film ends and, and where it goes. Yeah, that's, I actually love um, watching films or reading books that where memory is such a huge part of it because it is unreliable, you know, and we all have our own narrative about what actually happened. And that was something that really kind of captured me in when I was watching Learn to Swim was just the fact that, you know, you, you're, you are questioning even if certain characters are fabricated out of like, like at a certain point, I was like, is, is that, does that person really exist or just exist in his mind? You know? Um, so I was really, I was really quite taken with that. And I was also really touched because there was this one point where, um, where your main character is watching, uh, is, is, has returned to um, the, the restaurant uh, and sees himself being served at the restaurant, but then it becomes somebody else. And, and I, I think we do that, right? We, a lot of us, all of us, we're human beings that live in our heads, you know, and we are, we're sort of, uh, we create our own sort of narrative and our own reality as we go along. And I think that's just such a touching thing because, because that's such a human part of, of everybody, right? Absolutely. And like the whole movie is, is from his perception of, of things. So, you know, we have to trust this person who's going through this large amount of, of emotion and guilt and, and trust that he's telling us the, the right version of the story. And there's only one moment in the movie where it's not his perception of things. And it's when, uh, it's what after he leaves the apartment when Selma um, is by herself because we had this rule in the film that like none of the film would ever happen outside of Desi's perception but that one moment where he, she closes the door Desi's no longer in frame mm. and it's the one moment that we're with Selma it's one moment that's outside of his perception and so that was that was a really interesting um, aspect of the film because it was one of the times we like broke the, the rules that we had sort of written for ourselves um but then it just goes back to like, you know, him, what does he think, what does he believe her to be doing on the other side of the door versus mm -hmm. like what she might actually have been doing. So I'm super curious about your process um, because I'm assuming that you came to that when you finally finished writing the script and then you were like, well, now let's like put my director's hat on. How is, what are the rules? Or did you have the rules in mind when you were writing it? The rules were always there. We always had this, Everything, like the transitions and how we wanted to move through the, the time periods and all of that, that was always something that we were building into the script. I had mm -hmm. the pleasure of working uh, with a woman, Marnie Van Dyke, to co-write the script. And so, um, and the reason for that was because when we went to CFC, it started as an exercise. Mm. And so they pair you with a writer and a director. And so Marnie was a writer, I was a director. And so Marnie wrote the original short film of the of the film based on our conversations and a great poem by Stevie uh, Stevie Smith, uh, not waving but drowning, and so when we went to do the feature, you know, Marnie wrote some of the drafts, and then I came in and started putting my director's voice and things over it. Um, some of the way that they speak to each other and interact with each other, the transitions, all of those different elements, and so that was always inside of it of that approach of like okay it's, it's always going to be from desi's perspective so we can't have a scene where um selma is like speaking to somebody but she's like by herself and mm -hmm. or you know sid is going to visit you know a, the record label to talk about the concert that they're the tour that they're going to be on it has to be from desi's perspective and if it's not then it's something that you know, like there's a conversation that Selma has at the doorway with the delivery man. And it's like, we hear the conversation, but we're with Desi. So it's like mm -hmm. still seeing that she's having, but still from his point of view. In terms of the themes that you, you touched on, for you, what was the strongest one? What was it that you really wanted to impart when you made this film? I think really just, I, I really wanted someone to go through the different 
elements, not just of like Desi's guilt over what happened, but like I also wanted to really explore the romance of it. I really wanted to, you know, I, I you know, myself as a, as a black Jamaican man and, you know, I've dated, you know, Afro-Latina women before and that's such a very interesting dichotomy, you know, when we date outside of our cultures. And so for me, this relationship between this very strong-minded uh, Latin woman and this very strong-minded Caribbean man that was, to me, an important element that I also wanted to explore was, and, and go through, you know. And then, of course, the second part of that is his guilt over what happened, which is something that I experienced that I was unpacking and film, which is what we always do, is we take all of our main experiences. Therapy. Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, come on, everybody, let's get a 200-person crew together. And... <laughs> but now you're over it. Therapy. Yeah. Pardon me. I said now you're over it and you're healed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hours, hours of filming later, you know, that therapy is complete. <laughs> and now you get to be here and you work with Array. So it's all like win win. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I feel like all the films, and, and like maybe for yourself it's the same. I feel like all the films, you know, like even with Mariner, it was like unpacking that, you know, that mm -hmm. I, the psychological, um, chaos of, of being in a, a black marine navigation cadet in a very, very white space. Um, yeah, I, I was really surprised um, that that's what you were studying before. And then you dropped out because you wanted to become a filmmaker. Yeah, I thought I, I figured if I if I could figure out how to become a marine navigation cadet, maybe I could figure out how to be a filmmaker. <laughs> I mean, I think it could work. Yeah, you yeah. obviously have shown that it can. <laughs> yeah, so. It was a wild idea at the time, though. So what about the music in Learn to Swim? I mean, was that always uh, a part of this world? Or, or, I mean, obviously it is. That's part of the backstory. But it plays such, it's, it's almost a character in itself when you're watching yeah. this. And so yeah. was that something that developed over time? Was that something that you um, just knew offhand that this was like, this was going to have that much, like the music was going to have that much presence in this film? Oh yeah, no, for sure. I think for every film that I do, I create these extensive playlists. There's, there's two, three hour Spotify playlists that mm -hmm. I forcibly make everyone sit through. Oh, you know, nice. I send it out to I everybody. It's very private. I like the fact yeah. that you force people. Yeah, I, I send it out <laughs> and I like, question people. I'm like, do you, do you listen? To, what do you think of track eight? You know? Um, and then if they have it, and I'm like, all right, we're putting it on. And next one's like, dude, we're trying to like, kind of do schedules, you know? Um, but. <laughs> I it, we, I always knew it was going to be wall to wall music, and like the interesting thing about doing this film was, you know, with other films is you shoot them and then you score them later, you know, and you work with your composer and you try to create some some kind of texture or sound to it based on that playlist. But with this film, we had these all these musical moments that were written into the script, and so we knew that in order for the actors and the performers to really capture these characters and for it to feel um, legitimate and to feel like real that we really need to do it beforehand. And so that was sort of the wild decision that I was like, we need to do it before. And everyone was kind of like, oh, I don't know, dude, we could just say have them mime it and then we could come back later. I'm like, no, 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 we gotta like get them together. And so it was a bit, we, we worked with a, a music supervisor named David Heyman. He, we had met him during um, I'm sure for people that are watching this out of context, there's a, me and Agam are Canadian, and there's a thing called Telefilm, and they give you money, and it's from the government of Canada. And so, we were doing that thing. Blowing people's minds right now. They're yeah. like, the government gives you money to make films? <laughs> it is a small amount of money, but it is money nonetheless. It is money. Um, but it's, and so, they did this, like, you know, that meet and greet thing that they do. Um, when they announced new films. And so we met David during that process. And he was a big champion of the film of just trying to get us to meet other like local musicians and, and such. And um, when COVID happened, he actually passed away like very, very shortly after. Oh, sorry. And so at that point we were sort of in this limbo because we had been contacting all these musicians and trying to find someone to write music for the band. And because we were all at home, 
uh, Chester Hansen and Leland Whitty, who were part of a band called Bad Bad Not Good, um, they were at home too. They were we had reached out to them, but they were supposed to go tour Coachella or something like that prior to the mm-hmm. pandemic. And then we were all just stuck in Toronto, and so we got together and they, we started writing the music for the band. And David had introduced me to Tika, and Tika worked with Casey, and we started working together on the music for Selma, and. It was just it was just this natural process, and then at some point Emma gave me a playlist because I make playlists, but then I forced the actors to make playlists. I'm like, what's your character? Oh, listen to? I like it. <laughs> That's great. And so she sent me a playlist, and then it had Megan DeLima on it, and Megan uh, DeLima had gone to school with Chester and Leland, so like we know Megan, and so it's like let's get Megan in here, and so like Megan comes in. And then I'm like, have you ever acted before? And she's like, no, and I kind of don't want to, but I'm like, ah, but you'd be so perfect. And so she ends up playing Naya um, because the person who was playing Naya had fell out. And um, so it just became this like very serendipitous, so I keep using that word describing this film, but this one of the things where one thing sparked another and we just came up with all this music, but um, it was definitely a challenge because musicians and filmmakers speak a very different language. I love all the musicians that we worked with on this film, but we, it's, it's very different because they're very much, I think like in this very pure art form mm-hmm. of just mm-hmm. like, let's try this. And in film, you realize just how kind of, not stringent we are, but like there's a bit more of a, of a schedule to how we do things. Right. Because yeah. all the people have to come together. <laughs> Whereas in music, it's not so much like that. You sort of have to let yourself go a bit. They're a bit more free spirited in their process. Yeah, <laughs> where we're like, we need song number seven for day five. <laughs> yeah, like, sure. <laughs> so, where did you find your your actors then? And did you have them in mind when you wrote when when the script was was being written? Yeah, um, Thomas was sort of always going to be Desi. We had worked right. together on there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had gone to CFC together. He's in the exercise. And so I, I, you know, when I was doing it, I was keeping my, keeping it very open, but I always knew it was going to be Thomas. Um, right. And so, you know, at one point we're just like, all right, dude, like you, this is what's happening. You're doing this. <laughs> um, and he, you know, he was obviously like very excited and, and wanted to do it. And he played saxophone when he was younger. So it was, oh. that was something that was, um, formulated into the script because in the in the exercise it was a trumpeteer, right? As we having the talents of playing saxophone prior, we just leaned into that with the character, right? And then with Emma, it was going on this wild search to find this Afro Latina actress mm-hmm. who could encapsulate and play that role. And you know, for such a multicultural city and country, it was extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but at some point, um, her agent, Larissa, uh, sent her over to us. And she, during her audition, she sang, she did, she had a fabulous audition, but she also yeah. sang uh, Paloma Negra from Chevella Vargas, like that version of it. And the thing was that that song was in my playlist, that original playlist that had been there the whole time. It was written into the script, but she never saw that version of the script. So it was just another one of those like serendipitous moments where she just chose the song that was the song. Um, And then when we brought her in to read with Thomas, it was like, we knew right away. We're like, this is Selma. We have it. Oh, that's such a good feeling, right? When you find all the missing pieces. Yeah. And like getting, and then finding like uh, Andrea Davis, who plays Sal in the film and, and, bringing the band together and it was it was tricky because like, they didn't get to rehearse you know we, we had t- we had a table read and then the pandemic happened mm. and so all these actors had to sit at home and they were just being sent music all the time and mm. they went off with their instruments and was learning this music and just sitting with themselves you know between March and December and so the first scene that takes place in the film where they're all together is in is the apartment scene when they're playing together. Um, yeah. And that, you know, that day was, you know, it was the first time that they were performing, that we had any shot, any of the music. 
it was the first time that the entire band was together. And so, you know, they're, they hadn't rehearsed and you're, you're a little bit like, what's the dichotomy of these guys going to be? What are they going to be like? And yeah. how naturally, first of all, how prepared they came, ready mm-hmm. to throw down. And then secondly, just how much of a vibe they fell into with each other. Mm-hmm. It was just like when that day wrapped, we were like, okay, we're going to be fine. Oh, that's such a good feeling. Yeah. So you guys shot deep in pandemic. So like 2020 before yeah. anyone was vaxxed. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I did too. So yeah, I, I get it. But it's, yeah, it's you, shot, you shot a few months later, right? I did. Yeah, I shot uh, January 2021. Pre-vax. Pre-vax. It's, and it's interesting because I found that it just creates this container where everything becomes very intimate. Nobody can go anywhere. Um, it was cold. We were in Regina. It was super cold. Nobody wanted to go anywhere. And so really the only safe space was like each other's rooms and to like watch like Netflix together or just like hang out. And, but as a result, it percolates and something really special happens. Did you find that as well? Yeah, I think, you know, the, there's something to be said about that cold, but shooting stuff in the middle of, of, of like winter. When, you, when exactly? So we shot in December of 2020, and then we had oh. a, a bit of a shutdown. Um, and then we yeah, we're always up. shut down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Toronto was going through, you know, it was open, and then, you know, this, the numbers were spiking, and they're like, no one's doing anything. And so you were sort of always looking for, like, this window of time where you could just go and shoot. Before, oh, so you know, even during the shutdowns, you guys, like, for some reason, I just thought that if you had started a project, um, if there was a shutdown, you would still continue the project, but that's not the case. Like, that means that you well, just that have came, to... That came later, where they sort of had this, um, if you're already in it, then you could sort of just complete it, you can completely go. But because we hadn't started the project, you know, we hadn't actually started before the pandemic hit, we, you know, we had made the decision that we were... We got into November and we're like, there's an opening, let's do this, let's try to do it before Christmas. Um, and we just didn't make it. And so we picked up the rest of the film in April. So it's it's almost half and half, you know, about nine days there, nine days uh, in April. But um, Emma was talking about one of the days, uh, the Japanese or the Asian food restaurant day. It ended up being like a Japanese tapas restaurant, but, um, the that on that uh in that during that scene that you know they were all outside in a tent and you know we had heaters and stuff like that but it's you know it's toronto it's still freezing cold yeah. and them just like riffing on each other right like they're so miserable and then they come into the restaurant and they're all hanging out and so they've already been just like at each other for the past <laughs> few hours so all of a sudden there's no difference in just turning on the camera and just letting oh, them oh i love that that's yeah. so great where you can when that happens to the actors and they're really just sort of like the same person on and off screen, you know, yeah. they're that same kind of energy. I think that's like it's so natural, right? And and I felt it when I watched your film. Yeah, it's so interesting watching them sort of build up their own sort of relationships to each other and, uh-huh. and how their characters are and, and what they protect and what they don't. And it's something that you know, I think a lot of times directors try to like force. To try to like manipulate into but I, I feel like really for me it's just creating the intention and creating the situation and great actors are going to find it within themselves you know if we do, if we give them the space totally and i think also half the job is is casting you cast the perfect people for these roles so you can almost just rest assured that they're going to you know like you said you gave them the intention they're going to be able to find it and and your job's kind of done. It's not like you have to try to change them to be any, anything else, you know? Right, absolutely. Is that a process that you really, for you, for casting, like when you were casting your film, was that, was it hard trying to find people, find people from the culture, find people that could speak to the individual characters themselves? Like, what was that like for you? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I so, Stephen Lobo plays Parm, who was my twin brother, and he wears a turban and has a beard and stuff. Um, So Stephen Lobo is South Asian, but he comes from a mixed background. 
and I've worked with him before. And so I always knew that I wanted to work with him again in some capacity in this film, but I didn't actually peg him to be that character right off the bat. I really wanted to find like an actual Sikh man. Um, and there's not a whole lot of them around <laughs> that, 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 you know, that also had the heart of, of who Parm was. Um, and would be perhaps like have, brave enough to go there, you know? Um, and so Steven and I talked about it and he was very uh, enthusiastic to play the role, but also very like respectful to the fact that like, maybe it's not his role to play, you know? And we're in a interesting time these days where those questions matter um, and those discussions matter. So, so yeah, kept auditioning. And then in the end, like auditioned him and he was the guy. And so uh, I just went with that. I went with my gut. Because I also think that like, as much as you try to get them as close to the ethnicity that you imagine, a huge part of it is also the soul and the breath of the character. And you want them, you, 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 th that matters too, you know? Um, and then some of the other characters were people that uh, I had known. Um, Hussein Madavji, he's from Toronto. I don't know if you know him, but um, I never knew him before and he just kind of captured the character so it was sort of a mix of like just just sort of like going with my gut feeling about certain people and then also working with people who I knew were like great artists and that they would they were gonna do a wonderful job I, 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 as well yeah yeah so this is a person that I'm so glad we're talking about because I think he's super special and so talented Leonardo Harem, who is my DOP, and he just DP'd something for you too, right? Yeah, we just worked on a, a doc series together, um, which was so funny because, you know, I went to Vancouver and then we're speaking and um, he's like, I worked on this movie, Doc, you had it. I'm like, isn't that like a movie that Ray has? And, and it's just and then like, I think we, after we started working together, it was... I'd have to go back, but it's probably like a week or two after we started working together is when I found out that I was going to be working with Array. And so it was, oh, just, it was another one of those like, yeah, it was just another one of those like odd, serendipitous learn to swim moments. We yeah. just keep talking about the ghost of learn to swim and, and how it kind of moves like that. But um, Le yeah, Leo is, is incredible. Um, Nick, if you're watching, you're still my, my favorite. I love you still. You're my brother. Um, but Leo, actually, yeah, he did an am yeah. amazing job on Learn to Swim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I think the thing about Leo that I really love is, um, is just the fact, well, he's Brazilian, right? And now he lives in Canada. And I think he just has, I just like his perspective on mm -hmm. cinema and on the world. Sometimes I think if you um, are, are living in a place for a long period of time, you start to obviously absorb all of, all of the styles, uh, from that place. But I think when people are international, you know, they're just a bit more open to doing things differently or seeing the world in a different way, which I find is always very interesting, you know? Mm. Um, and so, how, yeah. and like, how do you work, you know, with, with me and Nick who, who shot Learn to Swim, Nick Kate, you know, we have a very great working relationship that that we've built over the, over the years and over projects and such and so it, it feels very not we challenge each other a lot but it feels very very natural um leo comes in and he has a lot of the same traits and a lot of the same things that i love about my relationship working with nick for, for you was that your first time working with leo and what was it like sort of coming in with the cinematographer because you know sometimes that relationship can be a bit tense more so than you'd want it to be. Totally, yeah. Um, so I worked with him, actually, I was an actor uh, working with him. And I just remember uh, there was this thing here in, in Vancouver called Crazy Eights, which is um, you have like, like eight days to make a film. Uh, and I was an actor on it and I remember seeing Leo and he just had this huge smile and a real great way to command uh, the crew in such a gentle, like, uh, gentle way like he just was a good leader but uh, and very kind so he made an impression on me and when I was looking for um, a cinematographer I interviewed a bunch of people because I didn't want to get in a position where things were gonna be tense because as a director and actor I'm just like this is somebody that I'm gonna have to like trust so much and I just I don't want it to get like weird you know and so we talked and 
I don't know, we just had a good vibe. We just, uh, I respect him, he respects me, and we, we like the same kinds of stuff, and he was educating me a lot, you know, uh, and I was sharing with him stuff, movies that I loved. Um, so it just felt like we had similar taste in some ways, and, um, and it was good. It was a good relationship, for sure. I, I heard for you, uh, with Learn to Swim, that you were, is it true that you guys wanted to try to make every frame look like an album cover or is that gossip? Yeah. Yeah. It was like That's every frame was like a painting, which is <sighs> what, you know, it's a tough ask on any, on any project, much less on your first feature, but yeah, a big, a big, a big uh, inspiration for us was album covers, like blue note album covers from the fifties and sixties, a lot of like funk soul, um, uh -huh. R&B covers from the 70s so you know we just had a bunch of like albums that we're just looking at and just looking at the framing and the lighting and how they're positioned and we're always just chasing that you know um for me and Nick because we've we've had the projects we worked on together and we have that sort of rapport on this one we, we really wanted to challenge ourselves and so we sort of set this rule where when we were doing something if it felt a little uncomfortable we would call it out and, yeah. and sort of to the other person and be like, hey, how do you feel about this? And if the other person was sort of like uncomfortable about it, you'd be like, well, let's lean into it. Don't run away from it, you know? And um, so that sort of like having that was just so energizing. And it led to a couple of like scraps, you know, a few times where, you know, there's, there's a scene in particular where I think it's shot like six different ways. Cause you know, we're trying to line it up and we're like, ah, oh, this is not working. And then we're doing it again. And then, you know, we're like huffing and puffing and then eventually you find it and you're like, oh, there it is, you know? Um, <laughs> but it was really, it was really such a beautiful working thing. Cause for me and Nick, um, there's no ego. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that I love about working with him is, you know, I'm, we're, it's so seamless, you know, mm -hmm. neither of us are caught up in our own bullshit. It's just really mm -hmm. like, what's the best thing for the frame that's happening mm -hmm. right now. And we're always working towards that. And so it's something that you don't get very often in, in a relationship, in any relationship, much less this, this one. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's, it's what I love about working with him. Also the fact that he's super effing talented. So. so talented. I was really, I, I feel very inspired to do something like that on my next film. You know, I, I just think that's such a great way to sort of evoke imagery you know take something that you love albums and album covers and try to emulate that as much as you chase that like like you said yeah. um so i'm super curious how you went from this wonderful relationship with your dp who was probably at your hip like you guys were probably inseparable to working in tv <laughs> how was that <laughs> for you because we were we were talking about it a little bit before and then we stopped ourselves so that we had some more juice <laughs> for this yeah. conversation. Yeah, no, TV, I mean, TV's, funny enough, me and, and, and Nick, for all the projects that we've done together, we haven't done TV together. And yeah. it's just, it's more, part of it is scheduling. Know, like right now, um, uh, he's working on a show out in Nova Scotia. Uh, I think it's, I believe it's Moonshine, but don't quote me on that. Um, mm. And so, for the doc series, you know, it was like, okay, we need to find a new DP and someone on the doc series had worked with Leo. And so they suggested him and, he, and, and we met up in that way. And so a lot of times, you know, I did an episode of a show called Murdoch Mysteries and, you know, they have their DP that's been there for seasons on seasons. So a lot of times you don't get to, it's not the same in features where I actively able to pull the DP that you want to work with into the process. So you sort of have to build, rebuild this language again with someone new and very, very quickly. Yeah, I'm going through that right now. I'm, I'm about to shoot my very first episode of TV and um, I think awesome. that- Congratulations. Thanks so much. Um, th that's been, it's, it's been a learning curve, you know, cause I come from indie film world and, um, and then you suddenly, even though I've done tons of TV as an actor, I know the pace, but I, I didn't, this is naive. I didn't realize that my DP wouldn't be around cause he's on set. Right. So I, I'm like, so how do I how, like, <laughs> I have questions. What do I do? And fortunately I have a wonderful mentor to sort of help me through that. But, uh, but yeah, it's a very different kind of world and, and 
you know, it, it's different from set to set, it seems like. Some sets, they've been around for, you know, so many seasons that you, you, you kind of just, some directors block it out have an idea of what their why it is and then that's kind of it everybody else sort of takes over and then they just sort of shoot it in the language that they know so it's very different very very different i'm, I'm still wrapping my head around <laughs> this whole yeah thing. and i mean in every show i feel like you know i've done about three different i've done three episodes over three different productions over the past year and each of them are very 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 different both mm. in their language and how they flow. And so you have a show like Murdoch that's been on TV for 15 seasons and it's very structured in what it does. Mm -hmm. And same thing, you don't get to meet the DP beforehand. So you have to so show up with your own idea of how to go about things. And of course, those conversations happen very quickly on set. And then, you know, you have something like the doc series where um, the first week actually that I worked with Leo, we hadn't met, we just met that morning. When I, uh, we came in, you know, we didn't get to to actually speak about anything beforehand. But in the sub, because there was a gap between when the other parts of the episode were being filled, we did get to sit down and, and have those conversations and get to talk, mm -hmm. which was a pleasure. Because for the two episodes of TV I did before that, you know, me and the DP didn't have that. We didn't get to have those conversations, those talks. Yeah. So it was really refreshing to finally be able to be like, hey, what do you want to shoot? Let's shot this together, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's so wild. What, what is the thing that you feel as a as a storyteller, as a director, as a writer, um, as an auteur? Like, what is it that you do really well that you can always lean into? I think a lot in tone, and I think a lot of in emotion and in mood, and so everything informs that. Everything I do. And so if I, I, if something I didn't know about myself until like as time has passed, I feel like I've finally have seen enough things of myself where I'm like, okay, you do that. Um, a funny antidote is uh, they played a bunch of my shorts for a film class once. And, you know, they, they break down your film and someone was like, you're really into bathrooms. There's always <laughs> a bathroom scene in all of your films. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> didn't know that about myself. Didn't know. <laughs> but apparently that's what I do. But yeah. um, I, it always starts with mood and with tone. I always think about what the tone of the scene is, what the mood that I'm trying to create, what uh -huh. emotion I'm trying to create. And then everything comes from that, like where the actor should go, what the intention is, where the camera should be. All of it comes from there. And when you're thinking about mood and thinking about tone, do you... Do you see it visually or do you feel it or is it like color or is it like what is that? Do you know what I'm talking about? What is that first thing that kind of hooks you in when you're like, oh, the tone of this is this? Like what? Do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, like, <laughs> like I think about like a, a, a I think about like a scene. Um, like I think about like people ask about the dental scene, for example, where we're oh, over yeah. And so... You know, I, we, I always knew that he would be rising up into frame. I love that, yeah. Um, and there's going to the dentist, especially when you don't know what's wrong with you, is so anxiety filled. You feel so separated from it. Feel whenever you're at the doctor's or the hospital, it always feels like you're watching someone else go through it. So there's a very objective mm -hmm. feeling towards it. So when we did it, um, we we shot the first piece of it, and then Nick is like, you know, what if we just stay up here? And I was like, ooh, like, we can't do that, you know? It's like, it's like, yeah, we can. I mean, we just did it, so let's yeah. just continue it. And from there, you're like, right, the tone and the mood of this is the anxiety of not yeah. knowing what's happening to you and having this growth start. You know, we're setting the tone of this jaw infection is going to be taking us throughout the entire movie. So, yeah, we should stay up here. We should stay in this sort of objective anxiety. So it, it really... There's a physical. I think about the physicality of it. I think that's the next thing that comes when I think about huh. the tone or the mood of what's happening. That's so interesting. Yeah, I love, I love that scene and that shot. And it was interesting because the dentist was talking, and you don't really cut to her very quickly. You know, you stay on him for a while, and then you cut to her. And there was just something about that that I really liked. You know. Yeah, and like even you know, I think, and like I'm always trying to refine things. So with me and Nick, it's like you know we will shot list for a scene and we'll have like four or five shots for a scene 
and then we get to it and then it's constantly like can we do this in two or three and it's not even a more of a speed thing or us trying to like be efficient although you know we should be efficient um for the producer's sake but it's really about us just being like what's like how do we strip away all the things all the sort of hang-ups that we have as filmmakers and get down to the essence of what this is what is the actual thing that we're that we're chasing after um and so i do that with with scripts you know the first thing i do when i'm when i have scripts is i'm looking at how do we refine it you know this person's saying a lot to the other person can Mm -hmm. it be a look can it is there something else in which they can convey what they're feeling? Um, and in the edit, it's the same thing as well. You know, when the edits come in and there's all these cuts everywhere, and I'm like, what if we took two of these cuts out? You know, what do we have? You know, mm-hmm. where do we go with it? it so always- you always have it. You shoot it, but then you, then you start stripping it away, even in uh, as yeah. it goes along, yes, from yeah, the script onwards. Constantly, constantly just like stripping pieces of it down trying to just refine it to its like most purest form so to speak or the form of it that feels the the least sort of i've intruded on it Mm. you know where i don't i don't want like i think one of the things um that can happen sometimes when you're directing especially you know is that like i i start you start feeling the hand almost you start feeling the person is trying to like tell you where to go or guide you where you want to go. Um, And you want to like take away from that. You want it to feel like very instinctual and natural, or at least I I want to, that's what I'm attempting to do all the time. Yeah, and I think you're very successful at that because I did feel that in the film, now that we're talking about it, it's like there is this sort of, I don't know, it, it was interesting. It was like, it felt very intimate and yet at the same time objective in a way. Like, it, it didn't feel like, like, as an audience member, you had to come to your own conclusions, and you had to kind of think about it, as opposed, to, like, there was no, you know, like, there was nothing that was really trying to manipulate me in the process of watching the film. Mm. That's great. Yeah. I never want to leave the psychology of the character. So I never want us to, like, you feel like I'm now saying something. Like it's Desi, like Desi is telling the story. So it's like whatever feeds into that. So I'm super curious about the Toronto connection. Um, I was really excited when I watched the film. Um, Just because it's it's a way that I've, I've seen a million films from Toronto, but I've, this felt different, you know, and it felt different partly because it was a very diverse cast and, uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was really important to me that, you know, we just had a, just a breadth of different diversity that was happening in the film. You know, the relationship, you know, naturally between this this Black Caribbean character and between this Afro-Latina character. It's like, who are their friends? Who are they hanging out with? You know, who is, yeah. what's their circle? And so, you know, it was really important for me to, to, to show Toronto in that light. You know, we're such a multicultural city, and, but we also have these pockets, these pockets of culture. And it was also important to not hide or try to, like, shy away from the city, you know? Like, mm-hmm. we don't have any, like, sweeping CN Tower shots necessarily, but, you know, I never wanted anyone to think I was trying to... Like, it's it's Toronto. It's, it's a Toronto yeah. story, and so if you're from there... There's things that they say or things that they do or places that they go, and you're like, oh, okay, I, I totally get where that is. Yeah. Um, but if you're not from there, it's like a discovery, you know? Yeah, I love the way you shot the city. I love shooting uh, in locations and having them be real locations because it becomes a character and it it tells you so much about the characters. And, and in particular, there wasn't, you know, it wasn't this... Uh, Um, sort of splashy we're in Toronto like you said there's no CN Tower (laughs) you know but it was very much like all the million times that I've gone there when it's like cold and it's you know you're you're on a street and it's just like like, it just felt very familiar to me it was it was I really loved that quite a bit I think me and it's funny because me and Nick have a bunch of reference photos where there's snow Mm. Um, there was a bunch of bunch of times we want and it just it never snowed on set oh isn't that funny I feel like there was a point where we stopped for, we had to stop for about a week in the first block there for, for a few days and it snowed like crazy and then like went away. It's like typical Toronto kind of, <laughs> yeah. 
weather changes and completely something different. And we're like, of course, of course. Like, we're, we're shooting a Toronto winter movie and there's not going to be an inch of snow anywhere in this film. Like, this is the way Well, that's why I was asking about when you shot it because you said December, but it, yeah, I didn't notice any snow. So I was like, was it October? <laughs> like, when was just it? Like the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are trying. We were just trying so hard um, to shoot on a day where, you know, you get that beautiful, you know, when it just like, yeah. comes down on Toronto it's just a blanket um yes. and we're just hoping for one of those days and it just never came on a day that we were shooting um your next film yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll chase it again how much does uh being from Toronto being a black Canadian uh feed into the work that you do I think it informs it in many ways because you know I come from you know, my, my parents are, are first gen or they're, they're immigrants, so I'm first generation. So I'm taking in a lot of, you know, it's a mixture of being in a city that's very, very multicultural, that has so many different cultures, and then coming from a culture that's not from there. So mm -hmm. it's, it's odd because you always feel, you know that you're Canadian and, and you present as Canadian, but there's also this sort of like foreign outsider complex that you have to, you, you know. I'm not mm. sure what it's like for, for, for yourself and you can speak to that after, but it's like, you know, my, I remember my mom always saying like, you know, be careful because, you know, they'll send us back whenever they're ready. And you, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> send me back. Like, I'm from, I don't know anything else. I'm from here, you know? Um, but there's always that sort of like, it's a, it's interesting because you're, you're Canadian, but there's always this sort of outsider complex to it as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. I was born in England. I was raised, I moved to Montreal when I was three. So oh. raised uh, here. But um, yeah, I feel like so Canadian. Uh, but I'm always kind of amazed when I'm in circumstances where I feel uh, perhaps like the minority, you know, because uh, or, or where I feel like maybe I'm... Uh, I don't know. I, I, I feel a more like an outsider. Um, and that happens a lot in the film industry because, you know, especially when I was growing up, it's definitely changed a lot now. But, um, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of, of, of diverse faces in the crowd, you know. And so whenever I do see one, even now, I'm always just like I zone in and I start conversation because I'm just I don't know. I just like uh, I. I, I feel like there's a camaraderie there because we know, like, we've been through it. We know that we're one of a few. So it feels like uh, finding a unicorn, <laughs> usually. Yeah, yeah, especially within the industry because it's, it's interesting because you can live in Toronto. It's a very, very multicultural city. And yeah. so when you're in Toronto, you feel like your culture. Um, wherever mm -hmm. you're from, you feel that. So if you're Jamaican, you feel Jamaican. If you're Indian, you feel kind of Indian. You know, you feel more so that. But then once you go outside of that, to other parts of Canada that are much more homogenous to sort of like, oh, right, yeah, no, I'm I'm Canadian, but I'm also, like, not, yeah. not fully that Canadian. Um, but yeah, and the film space is so white. You know, pardon? The film space itself is so white. And the stories that are told, which is honestly why when I, I was so uh, touched and refreshed by your film, because uh, it was just very honest and... Uh, and, and very, like, very honest to what Toronto is, you know, um, whenever I go there and, you know, it, it looks exactly like that. So it's surprising that it feels uh, not shocking, but like, it feels like you did something different, <laughs> you know, um, and it's surprising that it feels that way when in reality you just showed what is, but it's just not something that we see very often. Uh, in Canadian film at all, I think Amer like I think Hollywood films, films from the states, are so much more ahead of it ahead than we are in Canada, in terms of diversity. Absolutely, yeah. There's still a lot of work being done, and, and like there's a bit of a shift that's that's sort of happening now, which is really nice to see. But it's you know, the process. The process. It's yeah. time. What yeah. brought you to taking Donkey Head as a story? Because because you've lived in other places in, in Canada, right? Like you've lived in Montreal, you've lived out west. So what, what made you decide to bring it to Regina to shoot? Uh, well, it was supposed to take place in Calgary. And uh, my, my producers were from Saskatchewan, they're from Saskatoon, and they convinced me to shoot this in Regina and, uh, and maybe double it for Calgary or 
try to do it so that we could uh, do, do all the interiors in Regina and then do a couple of exteriors in Calgary and sell it that way. And so that was the plan and then it just started becoming so complicated that I was like, okay, forget Calgary, let's just make this movie about a family, a South Asian family that lives in Regina. And it actually worked out so much better because it I think it Regina really reflects what the main character is going through. You know, she feels kind of stuck. She's she doesn't really know what she's doing in her life. Calgary, there's almost like too much happening. Like it's it, it is a city. You know, whereas Regina is a city that never grows, like people leave, uh, there's not a lot of industry there. And so it worked out, I think it worked out a lot better, but that's, yeah, that's yeah, why. Calgary is an interesting place. In Calgary? Yeah, it's a very interesting city. Um, it has a special place in my heart, but it is, you know. Did you live there for a bit or you, you worked for, there? For a year I lived in Calgary. Oh really, was it a girl? <laughs> That apartment. was the initial, that was the initial. <laughs> it's always because of love. I've heard that story so many times. <laughs> <laughs> that was what initially brought me there. Um, but then I ended up staying for a year. That ended very, very quickly. Um, but then I ended up staying for a year, worked in a, in a drop-in and rehab center in Calgary. Oh. Um, and yeah, it's it's an odd city because it is sort of, you know, it's the prairies. It's kind of in the middle of just flatlands, but... It's a city, nonetheless, and it has its own sort of personality, its own sort of quirks to it. Yeah, I, I went to high school and university there, um, and I remember the, the people are so nice, and they have a really cool theater scene, but I remember just feeling like I was kind of stuck in the middle of this country, and I couldn't wait to leave, and I, I wanted to go someplace either like west to Vancouver or, you know, east to Toronto, um, and... And yeah, I don't know. It has that. It has that feeling there. Like it's it's a it's it's a city, but it also feels very isolated. You know. Yeah. I think a lot of places in the prairies feel that way. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't think I've spent any significant time in Regina. I think I was there for two seconds overnight. I took a bus <laughs> to Calgary. So. You know what? I have to say, Regina is a great film city. It's um, you know, it's it's very small and so you can get around really easily and it uh it has some edge to it and i think that's really interesting when you show cities in canada specifically because canada is always beautified but when you can show cities and really show sort of like the factories and the rougher parts of it and you know the brick and all of that stuff i think that's fascinating as opposed to like here are the beautiful rocky mountains and the ocean yeah. and the <laughs> here's lake louise Here's like <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's been really wonderful talking to you, and I feel like I have a million more questions though, and hopefully I can talk to you about that in person one day. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be great to connect because I definitely have a lot of questions as well. <laughs> so it'd yeah. be great to connect at some point. But yeah, this has been this has been incredible. I mean, I, I, I I'm not sure how to how we tie bone but I guess like for you what what has it been like being an array filmmaker for you what was like from the time you know making docky head to being with array to now like what is that sort of journey that process been like for you oh um I mean I I think I I, I was the same as you I didn't really think about like how uh, I didn't think about anybody seeing my film. Like, I was just like, I made it. I wanted to go through the process of making it. Um, and I wanted to tell this story, but I didn't think that it would have necessarily a huge audience. Um, and so when, when it was sent to Ava and, uh, and to Lane, and they liked it and they wanted to, to have it as part of one of their films, I was just like amazed. Um, it really opened up the world and it was wild to receive emails from people who watched the film, you know, in Australia or in the UK and connected to it, whether they were South Asian or not. Um, and that's just such a, it's a, such a luxury to have that, to know that like something that you wrote and that has your voice on it can actually hit home for someone. I think one of my favorite emails, I got a message on Instagram, uh, this person, the South Asian person, Sikh Punjabi person that lived in like, I don't know, Arkansas or something going to med school there, like saw the movie on Netflix 
and messaged me saying how they felt so lonely being away from their family and so like isolated in this town where nobody looks like them. And then they saw the film and they just felt like it was a piece of home, you know, and they, they were just so grateful for it. And it was like, like those kinds of things, you know, cause I, I think that's the power of film. That's the power of like media of, of watching a great show or, you know, is that you can, you can reach so many people and, and they can see themselves and, and, and that's why it's so important to have diverse stories because we just need more of that where people are like, oh yeah, I'm seen and I matter and, and, and I can connect to something, you know, how yeah, about yourself? Absolutely. How is this like, I mean, this is early in your process now that it's just launched. You're going to have like weeks and weeks and weeks of interviews, but yeah. how is it, how has it all been sort of playing out for you? And I mean, what do you want to see? I mean, it, it, it is really remarkable, the idea that it's going to be, you know, I remember even with Mariner when we put it on Vimeo and you'd go and look at like what countries people have clicked on it and say, like, you know, there's people in like Israel and people in like Pakistan, people in like Argentina, like looking at your film. And so the idea that this feature that we've made is going to be playing in all these countries, countries I haven't even been to yet. Um, and, and people that are going to be watching and experiencing the thing that we made, it's, it's really 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 exciting and, and overwhelming but it's exactly what you wanted right it's like you wanted yeah. to just like shout it you know um from the rooftops once you finished it and and so you know being for me my mandate when i when i started working in film was to show uh black characters in places that we exist but are often not seen mm. and so you know, whether it was a young black archer or a young black marine cadet, or in this in this case, a, a young black musician, um, it was really, really important to to tell those stories, to tell it from our perspective, to be really truthful in that. And so, to be a part of a a family, to be a part of a a network, a company that's led by black women who have gone through these processes that have taken on the fearless work of, of, of knocking down these doors and knocking down these barriers and, and made room for themselves and are now making room for us to come in and explore and, and put out our work. It's, it's something that's a hugely fulfilling, mm -hmm. hugely, hugely fulfilling. And so this is that's serendipitous, isn't it? Yeah, like, it is. It is very serendipitous. Cause I remember rain. watching watching Ava um, when she was first touring around her film. It was like in 2011. And yeah. I was just, like, just leaving college being like, I'm gonna try it, doing this crazy <laughs> filmmaking thing. And here was this black woman literally like walking her film across America, um, doing the thing. And so here we are 10 years later um, and having this film with these characters, with this story being presented by her and her team. Yeah, it is very, very serendipitous. You know, I think it's it's also a, a power, like when the mandate is so much about, um, is bigger than yourself, like yours is, you know, I think there's so much energy in that and there's so much magic that can happen. And it just is the reason why things, there's so much flow. I, I think that's, that's my own personal kind of belief in it. So it doesn't surprise me that it found a home, you know, in this wonderful world of array. I'm excited to see what else you um, you come up with and what else you're you're gonna end up making. Dang, no pressure though. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of pressure. Like I, I really cannot wait. <laughs> like I'm sitting in the pressure right now. It's constant. Yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations again, and thank you so much for taking this time to talk to me. Thank you. Thank you again. It's very nice meeting you. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Please make sure to watch Learn to Swim by Tyrone Tommy. It's on Netflix right now. And watch Donkey Head by myself, Agam Darshi. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon.